All right, young people, you can go. We're getting ready to enlist you. Hopefully you know which service you're going to join. And if you're going to join, let's go out now, sign the papers. There we go. We got a bunch of them. We'll get them to KCU for two years and then send them to the military or vice versa. Steve Riley put that together and he asked me if we should do the Space Force song. Just in case, did anybody here serve in the Space Force? All right, I didn't think so. <clears throat> Not even, I think it's the theme to Star Wars is their song. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Well, again, thank you to all you veterans. I hope you took advantage of the free food yesterday. I know I did. I hit TGIFs for an early lunch. Then I went and got a half a sub and a car wash at Sheets. Then I went up to B-dubs and got 10 free wings. I didn't eat it all there. I brought some of it home. And would have had more, but I didn't want to drive to Barbersville or Southridge. Well, thanks for being here. This is, uh, gosh, we're rolling toward Thanksgiving. Let's not miss Thanksgiving. I know Christmas is only, what, 40-some days away, but Thanksgiving is our favorite, isn't it? You like Thanksgiving? It's quiet, good food, family, some good, good times. <clears throat> but we're in message nine of a 10 message series on the Sermon on the Mount. So we're almost there. We can see the finish line. Message nine. Maybe you've made all of these. And the, the beauty of technology today is if you go back and read these three chapters and you're, you're wondering about one passage, go back and find that sermon on our website, the sermon tab. You can find it with the QR code and you can go listen to that message. Or maybe you follow us on YouTube. We need more followers on YouTube. Just follow our page on YouTube and it'll hit your podcasts, I think. If it doesn't, you can have it hit your podcast. So uh, today we're in chapter seven because that's the last chapter. We're halfway down. We're gonna, we're gonna save a little bit for next week. But today we're uh, gonna start with verse 13 and we're in a sermon I'm calling Discernment and Decisions. Discernment and Decisions. And just by a show of hands, how many of you have ever made a dumb decision? Yeah, should be everybody, should be everybody. And how many of you noticed someone didn't raise your hand and you can tell them about a dumb decision they made? <laughs> like not raising your hand can be a dumb decision or raising it can be dumb. When I first joined the, the, uh, the army, uh, the thing was do not get noticed. Don't raise your hand, don't volunteer for anything, keep your head down and, uh, and just try to do what you're told. Right, Randy? And, and, but leadership rises to the top, so you know that's Randy. But anyway, uh, discernment is so important to make decisions. Discernment and decisions. I asked Google, how many decisions does the average person ask every single day? How many do you think, anybody? I don't want to give you time to Google it. 35,000 decisions every day. Google says 35 remotely conscious decisions every day. This could include whether or not you're going to hit the snooze button, what you're going to put on when you get up, what you're going to do when you get up, what you're going to eat that morning, what route you're going to take to work, what, what you're going to do at work, uh, all the things that come in a normal day. 35,000. No wonder we have decision fatigue. Did you know this is a real thing? Decision fatigue. Ladies, does your husband ever come home and he sit on the couch and you talk to him and you talk to him and you talk to him and he doesn't answer you because he seriously doesn't hear you because his brain is just like, sh there's a shut off switch. He's made too many decisions. Does that happen to anybody? Okay, a few people, yeah, all right. Decision fatigue, it's a new thing. There's probably medicine for it. Maybe like focus factor or something. Uh, but, you know, uh, decisions are important. Now, some of them aren't. Some of them are just humdrum, run-of-the-mill decisions. But there are some decisions in life that really matter. They really matter. Your life could depend on it, the decision you make. And we need discernment. The Bible says when a country is rebellious, it has many rulers and chaos but discernment and knowledge, a leader with discernment and knowledge makes good decisions, maintains order. 
So in the Sermon on the Mount, we're getting close to the end. This is the, what I would call the beginning of the introduction. Maybe you've heard a preacher say, and in conclusion, and then 10 minutes later, he was still <laughs> concluding. In conclusion, you know, I call, I call it landing the plane. You got to land the plane. Now, this is kind of the beginning of the, uh, the conclusion for Jesus. Beginning of the conclusion. And what he's doing here is he's saying, hey, you've heard my, you've heard my talk. You know what I'm about. You've listened to the main elements of this thing we're talking about now, what it means to follow me. And now I need you to make a decision. I need you to make a decision. And seriously, if you were to take Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, and you cut out all other parts of the Bible, and we wouldn't want to do that because we'd miss a whole lot, stuff we wouldn't want to miss. But if you, if you cut that out and all you had was Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you would know enough to know what it means to follow Jesus. I mean, this is the corpus of his uh, teaching. This is the, the, the main core of Christianity, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He was, he, he was contrasting, using it to contrast the, the outward legalistic behavior works-based religions of the world, especially Judaism, and he went right to the heart. He went right to the heart behind the behavior. You know, kids screw up, people do stupid things, people make dumb decisions, and you might say, you might say, look at what he did, but the question you really need to ask is, why did he do that? Why did he do that? What was the heart behind that? What is he misunderstanding? So parents, this is a little parent tip for you, instead of saying, why did you do that? Or, uh, you know, look at what you did, you should, you should sit him down and say, well, what, was the, what was your reasoning behind that? Was your, let's, let's understand the heart behind the behavior. And that's really what Jesus is doing here. And he's raising the bar. He's raising the bar for us. It's not just that your behavior matters, but the heart behind your behavior matters. Really, the heart matters most. So he's coming down to the end and he's calling for a decision. Jesus says, here it is. I've laid it out for you. Now I need to know what's your choice. What's your decision? Jesus has tried to help us. He's tried to show us. He's taught on all these topics and now he's bringing it down to, there's a choice. And these aren't just run of the mill decisions, uh, ordinary mundane decisions. He's, he's really asking us about three huge decisions. Life-changing, soul-saving. I'm gonna give them to you up front so you can think about them so they'll sink into you, all right? I'm gonna give them to you up front and then we're gonna talk about them. Here's the questions. Here's the decisions you need to make. First of all, where are you headed? Where are you headed? And this, is, this isn't just where you're going today for lunch. This is where you headed. In life, where are you headed? You're headed somewhere. You're going somewhere. Where are you headed? And secondly, who, who are you going to listen to along the way? You know, a lot of people out there really fighting, paying money to get your attention. They want your ear. They want your time. They want you to buy into what they're saying. They want you to do what they want you to do. And they're paying big money for it. They're, they're trying to influence you. They're trying to, to persuade you to do this, to say that, to eat this, to live a certain way. So big question, Jesus says, who are you gonna listen to? Who are you gonna let into the space between your ears? Who are you going to let feed into your life, speak into your life? And lastly, what are you going to live for? What are you going to live for? You're all living for something. We're all living for something. We could, we could look at your checkbook. We could look at your, your, your calendar, your schedule. What are you going to live for? These are the three questions Jesus demands an answer on today in this passage of Scripture we're getting ready to lead. And you know, when you think about it, this is, this is true. The gospel always demands an answer. It always requires us to make a decision. The good news requires us to say yes or to say no. But here's the tricky part about it. No answer is a no answer. No answer is a no answer. You're not going to get to judgment day and say, well, Lord, I was thinking about it. 
I just didn't decide then. I didn't decide that day. I didn't decide that day. I didn't decide that day. I, I'm still thinking about it. You, you don't get that option. You might remember the story of the rich young ruler. Remember this story? He came to Jesus, had everything going for him. And he said, uh, teacher, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, Sell, uh, uh, keep all the commandments. He said, I've done all that. He said, I've done all that. Yeah. And Jesus said, okay, uh, I, I see who you are. I see who you are. I see what you're made of. I see what you're living for. He said, go sell everything you have. Give the money to the poor and then come follow me. And the guy didn't say yes. He didn't say no. What did he do? The Bible says, in one of the saddest verses in the Bible, he turned away very sad. Very sad because he was a man of great wealth. So he gave no answer, which was a no answer. And so Jesus demands a decision, the gospel, the good news. You know, here in our service, I know there are a lot of churches who don't do what we're still doing. Uh, they don't do what we call a response time. That's a response time. Uh, I know uh, some, some churches used to call this an altar call. We don't use that terminology because we believe that the altar is gone. The altar's up there hanging. The altar was the cross. It was the last, uh, it was the last altar. And so now we just follow him. So we don't use terminology, the altar call, but that's kind of what this is. If you're from that kind of a background, we just call it a response time. It's time for you to respond. It's time for you to respond. Time for you to respond. And some of you have already responded and some of you haven't responded yet. And you're the ones we're really interested in, but there might be decisions that you need to respond to today because the gospel a good sermon always requires a response. We still do that here at Gateway. Some people don't do that anymore. We still do it. When Jesus was starting his ministry, he was walking along the road. He met two brothers, Peter and Andrew, and he gave them a choice. He said, hey, uh, I'm going this way. Follow me. They had a choice to make. They followed him. Went a little further. James and John also working on their nets. They were in the fishing business. Gave him the same choice. He said, I'm headed this way. Why don't you follow me? They followed him. Matthew was doing his calculations at the tax collector's booth. Jesus gave him the same proposition. Hey, you can stay where you are. You can keep counting. You can keep doing what you are doing, but follow me and I'll, I'll, I'll show you how you can count men. I'll show you how you can catch men. Be fishers of people. And so they all had a choice. Nobody's going to go to heaven with their arm twisted behind their back. God is not going to force you to spend eternity with him in heaven if you chose in this life not to have anything to do with him. He's not going to force you up there. He has not already made that choice for you. What he has predestined for you is the way it would happen. He's predestined the plan, not the man. And the plan is that you, that everybody, that's what the Bible says, all people can come to repentance. All people, he wants all people to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what Paul says. That's what Peter says. And the way you do that is what he has already laid out. This is how you do it. And so you have a choice. The path is laid out. He predestined you to become conformed to the image of his son but you have a choice he's not going to twist your arm he's not going to brainwash you he's not going to manipulate your mind so that you will choose him he wants you to make an educated partly emotional emotional but head and heart spirit and truth decision about him so first question with this text where are you headed? Where are you headed? Here's the decision. Choose which road, if you're keeping the outline that was published, choose which road you will travel. Verse 13, Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. You know, when I read these words of Jesus, I always think of that Robert Frost poem. I don't know if you're lovers of 
early American uh, poetry and literature, I am. And I always think of this popular poem called Two Roads Diverged in a Wood, The Road Less Traveled. And I, I wanted to read that to you this morning. I think Frost took his cue from what Jesus was saying here, but I put it on the screen so that you could follow me easier. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler, long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. And I, I think Frost is talking about the same thing Jesus is talking about. Maybe Frost is talking more about, you know, becoming a poet and doing the, uh, you know, the less uh, dirty work and more book work, that kind of thing. I don't know. They're, you know, those are choices we have to make today. But in a spiritual sense, there are two roads and there are only two roads. And don't misunderstand this. Don't miss this. There aren't many roads. You're not on a road and you're on a road and you're on a road and you're on a road and there's a hundred people, there's a hundred roads. No, there are only two roads. There are only two roads. Maybe you're on a detour on that road. Maybe you're experiencing something different on that road that somebody else is experiencing, but make no mistake about it, there are only two roads. There aren't many ways. Christianity, this is what's exclusive to them, is that there are not many paths to God. There are not many ways to live. Really, Jesus boiled it down. There are only two ways. There are only two roads you can choose. And Jesus wants to help us as much as he can here in this choice. He actually tells us which choice to make. You know, you, if, you, if you got a kid who is trying to decide what to pick. Have you ever watched that show where they, uh, they give the, the kid the opportunity to pick and it's some toy or it can be some trip to the Bahamas, you know, or 3,000 bucks. You ever seen that? And they give the kid the opportunity to make that choice. Anybody seen it? Somebody, somebody's seen it. Okay, good. And they give the kid without any influence the way they pick that. And the wise kid will say, oh, I don't, I don't really want that toy. It's a cool toy. I've always wanted that, but I better pick this over here. And if I were those parents, I would have told him beforehand, if we win this game and you get the pick, do not pick what you want. Pick what we want. And so here Jesus gives us the, Jesus gives us the, the, the hint. He gives us the help. He says, enter through the narrow gate. In other words, don't even consider the other way. Don't, don't even look that way. Don't even think about that way. Choose the road less traveled. We sang about that narrow road this morning in our first song. It's a narrow road. It's a narrow road. But Jesus does give us the choice. He gives us the choice and he, he describes both roads. Just so you have a choice. Let's look at these a little bit. First, there's the broad road. The broad road, the Greek word eurykouros, means wide and spacious. I mean, this is a wide and spacious road. It's so big, and the gate is so big that you could drive a Mack truck through it sideways. I mean, that's spacious, isn't it? I mean, you could drive a Mack, maybe three Mack trucks sideways. You could just drive them down this road. That's how big and wide and spacious it is. And there's a lot of people on this road. I mean, a lot of your friends are there. They're there and they're having a good time. They are. They're having a blast. I mean, there's partying on this road. There's pursuit of my dreams on this road. 
I mean, this everything I want to do and everything I long for, it's on this road. Everything, everything life could offer you is on this road. Now, who wouldn't pass that up? Who wouldn't pass up? If, if I could tell you that on this road, whatever your heart desires, you can have it. Nothing held back from you. No restrictions. Nothing. You can have it all on this road. Wow. I like that road. I like that road. There's only one problem. There's only one problem. And that's what's at the end of the road. That's what's at the end of the road. The Greek word is apoleon. And this is a common word in the New Testament, especially when you get closer to the back of the book, it gets common. Ap- apoleon means waste, ruin, completely cut off, utter loss, destruction, destruction. But it's fun. It's fun until you get there. I mean, literally, this is a big highway. How many of you are like me? You're, you, you just wish they'd get that road, I-64, finished out there. Anybody? Woo, I can't wait till it gets too cold to make asphalt. And it's spilling over into side roads. And it's, I think when they get done up there, there's going to be a 12-lane highway. What do you think, John? 12 lanes. Maybe we can go to the golf course sideways. I mean, literally, this road is a 12-lane highway to hell. Highway to hell. Now, I know some of you who grew up in the 60s and 70s just had a flashback. (laughs) That's what this is. And it is littered. It is well-worn and littered with the self-centered lives of its travelers. And then there's the narrow road. Now this road, this is the road Jesus is calling us to take, but he's, he's got a lot of convincing to do because uh, this, is, this is an imperative statement. Take this road. It's said with urgency, but, but he admits it's not easy. It's not easy. First of all, the gate. You know, the, the broad road is it's like, it's like a mass entrance, everybody. But the narrow road is like a single person turnstile. You remember those? I don't know if they still use those at theme parks and stuff, but it's, you know, you, th- that person goes through and then you got to push that thing that rolls around. And, you know, it always got stuck on me and it's like, whoa, I'm stuck here now. It's like a single person turnstile in this gate. Now, I'm a little disappointed in the NIV translators here because there's two Greek words used in this passage that's translated by the uh, NIV translators as narrow. It's three times. There's, it's, the, it's the narrow gate, then it mentions the narrow gate again, then it mentions a narrow road. And the first word is the word stene, which means simply just small. It's small. It's that single person turnstile. The gate is small. But then when he uses a word to describe the road, it's a different word. It's a different word completely. It's a word that, it's a long word, so I'm not going to pronounce it for you. But it means compressed, like you're pressing a lemon down to get all the juice out of it. It means, uh, it's na- it means narrow, but it, it, it's more than narrow. It means being made narrow by pressing on it, constricted. I like the New American Standard version to get me closer to the Greek, and it, and it uses the word constricted. The original New American Standard, constricted. I noticed the ESV says hard. It's a hard road. It's a constricted road. There's going to be pressure. And this word press here kind of comes from the word for persecution. You're going to be pushed in. You're going to be pressed. It's not going to be easy. It's not easy to turn the other cheek, is it? It's not easy to go the extra mile. It's not easy to forgive those who hurt me. It's not easy to love my enemies. It's not easy to fast. It's not easy to pray. It's not easy to to love and to give. That's not always easy. If you want the easy life, 
if you want the fun life, if you want the party life, if you want all your dreams come true life, this is not the road for you. This is not the road for you. And this is why there are many people on it. Because they, they, they don't want this. That's a hard life. You're telling me to choose a hard life? Yes, but I want you to know what's at the end of that road. The end of that road is life. You know, it kind of reminds me of, of people who hike a lot or people who go up in, you know, into the out west or in some places around here even. Like I've been caving before. What do they call that? Spelunking, yeah, I've been spelunking when I was a kid down in Mercer County. And some places, I couldn't do it now. Some places you could squeeze through there, you know what I mean? It's like, whoo, I'm a little claustrophobic here. And you squeeze through, but then when it opens up into this huge room and you get this view that you think, well, not many people have ever seen this. And it's like this big panorama. You squeeze through the rocks and you see this beautiful scenery, this view that, that only comes to those who who take the hard path, the narrow path, the constricted path, the pressed in path, and it hurts and you get some scrapes and maybe you're bleeding and maybe you're twisted some things that shouldn't be twisted, but you get there and you're like, ah, this was worth it. That's the road Jesus says to take, that road. He said, I am the gate and whoever enters through me We'll go out and find pasture. You know, this is always a choice. It's always a choice. Moses used to tell his people, he said, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, make a choice, choose life. His right-hand man, Joshua, the same kind of thing at the end of his life. He said, uh, choose this day whom you will serve as for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. Where are you headed, folks? There's only two directions. We got to be like the teachers, our teach, school teachers today teach the seven habits. And what is this habit? Think with the end in mind. Come on, teachers, where are you at? Question number two, who will you listen to along the way? Who are you going to listen to? This decision is which fruit will you pick? Watch out for false prophets, Jesus says. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So Jesus, I think this is one of those moments in the sermon where he's motioning over to the fringes where the Pharisees were standing. He's like, beware of false prophets because they're going to sound good. I mean, they're going to tell you everything you want to hear, but they have an agenda. They've got, they've got their own plan for you. And, and they're going to trick you into following them. And it's going to look good on the outside, but inside when you take a bite, it is going to be rotten to the core. It's going to be rotten. They, they look good. They're really, though, they're, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. You know, in the Old Testament, God did not tolerate a false prophet. In Deuteronomy 18, he said, The prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall be put to death. False prophets have always been a serious threat to God's people. They were serious even... Uh, Old Testament, even New Testament, even today they are. Peter said in 2 Peter 2, 1, he said there were uh, also false prophets among the people. Just as there will be false teachers among you, they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. So this really, uh, he, he's using kind of an analogy here. It's like, uh, you know, which fruit are you going to pick which fruit? And I think what he's doing here, he's, he's making us become fruit inspectors of the people that we allow to speak into our life. Now, I know I'm putting myself on the spotlight here. I know I'm putting myself here for you to judge me. But understand, I'm just a man. I have my faults. You can talk to my wife if you don't believe me. I know it's hard to believe. But if you talk to her, she will tell you. But really, when you look at me, you should, you should look at my fruit. 
If you look at my fruit, understand nobody's going to be perfect. There's going to be some bad apples. I'm going to make mistakes, but overall, here's what you should look for. I think the Bible talks about fruit. I think, first of all, you can uh, look at a man's character. Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Now, this isn't just for me. This is for other people in your life. This is for you. You're speaking into people's lives too. Speaking to your spouse, your children, your friends. You're trying to get their time and attention. You want to have your case be known. So look at yourself. How's your character? That's fruit. That's fruit. You know, leaders aren't perfect. They're still growing. They're still being shaped and sharpened. When you're choosing a leader, maybe he ought to be farther along than your next door neighbor who's telling you what to do. Also, I think a fruit, fruit describes a person's conduct. Matthew 3, 8, John the baptizer said, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, you say you've repented, let's see it. Let's see your life. You still using bad language? You still treating people discriminating? You still being prejudiced? Are you still, is that still part of your life? Still watching what you shouldn't be? I think this is the conduct fruit is the John 15 fruit where Jesus said, I'm the vine and my father is the gardener and he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. In other words, what, what are you doing with your life? If you claim to have Christ in you and you claim to be in him, you should live like it, right? Your language should sound like it. Thirdly, I think, I think fruit describes a person's work. John 9, 4, Jesus said, as long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. So when, you, when someone's speaking into your life, look at, their, look, at, yeah, look at their doctrine. Look at their teaching. Look at the fruit of his teaching and, and, the, and the people he's led to Christ. Now, I'm not talking about doctrine that would be considered non-essential because admittedly, we're not going to agree on everything. We need to agree on the big things. Jesus is Lord. Scripture is authoritative. Other than that, we can, we can go back and forth. Look, look, at, look at someone's life and their work and see what has it accomplished. Finally, uh, fruit describes a person's worship. Hebrews 13 says, through Jesus, therefore let us continue to offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips. So look at his, look at his worship. Is, does he obsess over material things? Is he more interested in his car or his home or his uh, this or that than he is in what God wants him to do, loving people, teaching, whatever? Is he, is he a materialistic person or is he, is he someone who's giving God the credit and the glory? Yeah, we, we have nice things. We can enjoy nice things, but who gets the credit for that? Look at his worship. So that's the second decision you need to make is who's, uh, who's going to speak into your life. Who are you going to listen to? You, which road are you going to travel? Who are you going to listen to? But let me tell you something. If you choose the wrong road, you can listen to anybody you want to. But if you choose the road Jesus says to choose, you better be selective who you let speak into your life. You better be careful or they'll pull you back. They'll throw you off course. The last question uh, that... I told you at the beginning is, what are you going to live for? And the decision here is choose whose will you will live out. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, woo, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, Jesus said, I never, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now these verses should give us some pause because it appears that these people are doing the right things. They're doing things the disciples did, right? They're casting out demons. They're, they're prophesying, they're teaching. They're doing miracles. They're doing it all in the name of Jesus. Didn't we do this in your name? Aren't we good? But here's the big question. Who did you do that for? Did you do that for you or did you do it for him? 
Whose name were you really trying to build? Is this, here's, here's what we should ask every time we go to do something. Is this what God wants or is this just something that I want? Is it just something that I want? And so that, that's, that's the question. Whose will are you living out? If you're saying, hey, God, here's my plan. I'm doing this in your name. Can you get, give me some blessing on this? Can you put your stamp of approval on this? God, I'm, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to do it in your name. Jesus may say, you know what? I didn't ask you to do that. Matter of fact, I don't, even, I don't even know who you are. You never talk to me. You just, when you do, you just tell me what you're doing. You never ask me what I want. And so what are you going to live for? What are you living for? Are you living to make a name for yourself? Are you living to lift his name up? Three big decisions today. Where are you headed? Where are you headed? There's only two, two choices. Who are you going to listen to along the way? You got to be fruit inspectors. What are you going to live for? You can live for yourself. You can live for him. Jesus says, decide. Now, here's that response time we talked about earlier. You know, a lot of churches aren't doing this anymore. We're still doing it. And maybe you've already made your decision. And I just, I just want you to pray for those who haven't. That's what you should be doing, singing, worshiping, and praying for those who haven't. Try not to distract the people who, who just might be right, right there, you know, ready to come. And pray for them. You might want to come and trust Christ for the first time and follow that up with baptism today. You may want to, maybe you've done that, but you've felt like you've been drifting. You may want to come and just say, you know what, I've been drifting. I just want to recommit my life to Jesus. What a great statement to make. Maybe you don't have a church home and you've just kind of been drifting around and maybe you want to say, hey, I want to be a partner here. I want, I want to be someone you can count on. I want to be someone you can count on. Or maybe you need prayer. If you come here and pray right around this platform, nobody's going to bother you. Just pray. Deal with whatever you're dealing with with God. If you want somebody from out there, what I would call a prayer partner, ladies, if you come up here, a lady will come pray with you. Men, a man will come pray with you. And if you want to talk to me or if anybody's over in that uh, stairwell about a decision or prayer, then you can come during this song. Let's stand up and let's do that.